Welcome to this week's episode of Reading the Gospels Through Hebrew Eyes. This coming Sunday is the first Sunday in Advent, which means that it's the first Sunday of a new year for the church. It's not January 1st, of course, but the church follows a different calendar, and the church's calendar begins the new year with the first Sunday in Advent, which is usually around the beginning of December. And as with every year, when we change into a new year, there's also a change of the dominant gospel for the readings of that year. So if you've been following these videos this past year, you know that, the, know that many of our videos, most of our videos, have focused on the gospel of Mark. There's going to be a shift in Advent 1, and we're shifting to the gospel of Luke. So it's Luke's account of Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem that's going to be the focus of our study today. Now, of course, we usually associate this with Palm Sunday, but traditionally, that reading is also the reading for the first Sunday in Advent. It kind of sets the stage for what is to come for the rest of the year. And because we're so associated, because we associate Palm Sunday so much with excitement and, and jubilation and kind of a party atmosphere, it's really, it's easy for us to miss just how provocative this action of Jesus was. So what I want to do is very quickly highlight the various elements of why this was provocative and then step back and go through each of each one of those individually to highlight just kind of what was going on behind the scenes, between the lines, if you will, when Jesus did this act and then what was going on with his disciples, what they were doing, what they were saying as Jesus was riding into Jerusalem. So to begin with, let's talk about how it was politically provocative. And we're going to focus then on just exactly what this would have meant. If you were, for instance, uh, a Roman official watching this happen, this would have been extremely provocative for you because it basically meant that this guy, Jesus of Nazareth, was claiming to be king and his disciples were claiming him to be king. Second, we're going to look at how this was iconographically explosive. And what I mean by that is we're going to look at various images like the palm branches and the donkey to highlight exactly why these images of these icons would have been so explosive in that atmosphere. And then we're going to look at how this was geographically loaded because where it happened and the direction that Jesus came from and the mountain that was associated with his entrance into Jerusalem, all of these form are formed by the Old Testament background, uh, specifically the books of Ezekiel and Zechariah. And then finally, we're going to look at how this account is scripturally saturated, how either through direct quotes or through allusions, this particular account is laced with all of these Old Testament references from Zechariah, from the Psalms, and from elsewhere. So that's kind of the outline of where we're going with this, and hopefully by the end of it, we'll have a better idea of exactly why this particular action on the part of Jesus was laden with such significance, and why, actually, then shortly thereafter, the opponents of Jesus, the religious opponents of Jesus, orchestrated his arrest, and of course, everything that followed subsequent to that. So to begin with, let's look at why and how this was politically provocative. And just to kind of under, help us to understand that, let's remember historically that for almost a century, since 63 BC, Israel had been under Roman domination. They were not free. They were under the Roman thumb and had been for quite some time when this happened. And of course, the Romans did not want any trouble. That's why they were always squelching rebellions. That's why they did everything necessary to ensure that this Pax Romana, this Roman peace, lasted throughout their empire. So just keep in mind that Israel, even though it has a modicum of independence, is not independent. It is under Roman domination. That's why, of course, you have Pontius Pilate, who's the Roman procurator, who's there in Jerusalem. He's in charge of that particular area. Keep in mind, too, as this slide indicates, that we have even portrayed architecturally, if you will, spatially, exactly how much of an impact the Romans had upon the Israelites. Because, of course, you're seeing here an image of the temple uh, uh, there in Jerusalem. And if you notice where the arrows are pointing, there's a fortress that's built right beside it, right adjacent to it. This was the Antonia Fortress. This was built, or perhaps enlarged, by Herod the Great. He named it after Mark Antony. That's the Antonia Fortress. This was a, a soldier's garrison. This was the, where the Roman soldiers stayed there in Jerusalem, at least house at least some of the Roman garrison there in Jerusalem. So you had, you had Roman soldiers 
right there beside the temple, and they were right there in order that if there was any trouble in the temple, they could step in and be basically the policeman and take care of the problem. And of course, if you know the book of Acts, you know that this actually happened more than once. And this was then a constant visual reminder of the Roman occupation. It'd be kind of like, you know, if you picture your church and your church has a police station built like right up next to it. And the main job of that police station was to keep an eye on what was happening inside the church and to stop anything that they didn't like from happening inside or around that church. That's kind of a modern parallel that would help us understand this situation happening there at the temple. And then, as you can see from this gory slide here, this is how the Romans maintained the peace. At least one of the ways they maintained the peace is through this these public executions, which are horrific and torturous and long-lasting, we know them, of course, as the crucifixions. And, of course, of course, when we think crucifixion as Christians, we think primarily of Jesus. But keep in mind that Jesus was far, far from the only one crucified by the Romans. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people that Rome deemed a threat, a danger, or a criminal, they were put to death. So this is one artist's depiction of a number of people who had been crucified. And this is a picture of something that happened in 71 BC. If you're familiar with the famous movie Spartacus, that story is based upon this. This is the end of it, basically. 6,000 men were crucified by the Romans along the Appian Way after the rebellion of Spartacus in 71 BC. So you can just imagine the scene of horror that this would have entailed. And of course, this took place very publicly. That, that, that was the reason they did it, was to make sure that everybody knew if you buck the system, if you go against Rome, if you threaten them, if you rattle the cage, well, then this is going to be your fate. This is what will happen to you. And of course, as we know in the case of Jesus, he rides in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, and after his triumphant entry, things began to unfold. And then by the end of the week, by Friday, he's on one of those Roman crosses. So that's why this was so so politically unstable, because Jesus was entering into a city that was controlled by the Romans. Certainly there was plenty of religious control by the Jewish authorities as well, but he's riding into a city controlled by the Romans, and the people are claiming him to be king. Now that's not something, of course, that Caesar or anybody loyal to Caesar would have liked, but that's what's going on as Jesus rides into Jerusalem. So there's the political provocation part of it. What about the, the iconographically explosive, explosive nature of it? What do I mean by that? Well, first things, first thing that, and most obvious thing is that Jesus doesn't walk into Jerusalem, which was the way that most Passover pilgrims would have entered the city. Instead, he purposely rides into Jerusalem and he rides on top of a donkey. So Luke describes this in chapter 19. This is the gospel reading for, for Sunday. Jesus told his disciples to go into the village in front of him. And upon entering, they're going to find a colt on which no one has ever sat to untie it and bring it here, he says. And if anybody asks you why you're untying it, you shall say the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away found it just as he had told them, and they were untying the colt. The owners asked, why are you untying the colt? And they said what Jesus told them to say, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, it was sort of a, a saddle, if you will, they put Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. Now, we want to come back to some of those details in just a minute. The first thing to keep in mind is that this is the only time in the Gospels where Jesus was said to move from place to place besides in a boat uh, on, on a donkey. Most of the time he's, he's walking or he's riding on a boat. This is the only time we have recorded for us when Jesus sat on this particular kind of beast. Now, sometimes you'll hear that the reason Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey instead of a, instead of a horse was to proclaim that he was not there for war. And that is true. That is true. He was, he was choosing the particular mount that was emblematic of peace. But keep this in mind. The, the, the donkey was, in the Israelite imagination, based upon Old Testament precedent, the donkey was a royal mount. If you had power, if you had authority, if you were a leader in Israel— then you or your sons, they rode on donkeys. Just so when you, when you think Jews or Israelites in the Old Testament and donkey, put these two together. Understand that the donkey was a kingly 
mount. So bear that in mind as we're working our way through these passages that we're about to get to. So if you go back to a couple of places in the book of Judges, for instance, we're introduced to uh, one of the judges, Yair, the Gileadite, judge of Israel. He had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys. If he had 30 sons, most likely he also had many wives. This was in, in a person with many wives, typically someone with power and authority and wealth. So he had a bigger family, 30 sons, 30 donkeys. Secondly, Judges 12, another judge, Abdon, the son of Hillel, judge of Israel, he had 40 sons and 30 grandsons. Again, this man would have had power, he would have had authority, he would have had wealth, and they rode on 70 donkeys, and he judged Israel for eight years. And then, most famously, and most importantly with regard to this animal, if you go to the opening chapter of 1 Kings, this is when David is on his deathbed, and if you remember the story, or if you follow along in my podcast, 40 Minutes in the Old Testament, we just covered this, it's when David is old, and his oldest son, Adonijah, is trying to claim the throne, and then through Bathsheba and Nathan and David, it's arranged to where Solomon instead is anointed to be king. And David says, take with you the servants of your Lord and have Solomon, my son, ride on my own mule. So God had promised David back in 2 Samuel 7 that one of his seed, one of his sons would sit on the throne. He's going to establish the dynasty of David. And that's exactly what now is happening in the case of Solomon. He's the one who is going to be the replacement of David. Even before David dies, David places him as the one who sits on his throne. And to designate that, to make sure that everybody knows, make sure that everybody knows that Solomon is the chosen one. He's not only anointed and has the, the prophet and the priest there, but he's riding on the king's mule. This is basically the equivalent of him riding in whatever the official car of the leader of a nation might be. That's where he is. He's riding on the king's mule, thereby designating him as the one who is the replacement of David. So here we have the son of David, Jesus of Nazareth, riding on top of a donkey to enter the city of Jerusalem, just like Solomon had rode into Jerusalem and assumed his place as well. What about the palm branches? Well, Luke doesn't record the palm branches. Uh, in fact, I believe it's only John that does that. But of course, we call it Palm Sunday. The palms are very much associated with this day. Well, why were the palms there to begin with? Well, they themselves have a, a history in Israel. If you go back uh, to 140 BC, this is after the time of the Maccabean Revolt. This is when the Maccabean rulers were over Israel at the time of semi-independence for Israel. Well, one Simon Maccabeus, he had expelled his enemies from Jerusalem, and when he did, the Jews entered it, this, that is the city, with praise and palm branches, and with harps and cymbals and stringed instruments, and they rejoiced because God had crushed this great, this great enemy. So palm branches there are associated with celebration and victory. Same thing happens later on. So we have these coins that you can see here. These are coins from the Great Jewish Revolt, which would have been 66 to 70, leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans in 70. And in 69 to 70, right before Jerusalem was destroyed, the Jewish leadership issued these bronze coins, which are just a fraction of a shekel. And these have on them the lulav, which is the symbol of the, the palm branch. And this has led some scholars to believe that the palm had become a sign of Jewish independence. And then later on, in 132 to 135, when you have the Bar Kokhba revolt, these same symbols are going to be used on those coins issued during that time as well. The point is that the palm branches that the disciples of Jesus were spreading and using to celebrate the entrance of Jesus, these had ramifications in the history of Israel. The palm had become a symbol of this desire for independence. Again, this would have been politically provocative, but it's certainly iconographically provocative as well, because these are these symbols of the desire for the Jews to be independent and for them to have this messianic king. So the palms are provocative. The donkey itself is also a symbol that a new king is in town. And then, thirdly, we have recorded in Luke's gospel, the, the fact that the disciples are spreading their cloaks on the road. What's that? What is that all about? How are they kind of making a red carpet, and what is the significance of that? 
Well, if you go back to the book of Kings, 2 Kings, chapter 9, verse 13, this is in the northern kingdom, and one of the kings who was anointed there was named Yehu. And it says that in haste, every man of them, after, after he was anointed, they took his garment and they put it under him on the bare steps. And then they blew the trumpet and proclaimed, Yehu is king. So once more, the fact that they, in the case of the disciples of Jesus, put cloaks in front of him as he rode is hearkening back to the way that Israel, the northern kingdom, greeted one of its kings. So altogether, between the donkey and the palm branches and the cloaks, everything, all these images, all these icons are suggestive of the fact that something huge is happening here. This is the king. This is the Messiah. This is the son of David, and he's riding into Jerusalem to establish his kingdom. Now, the way he establishes his kingdom is not going to be the way they, most of them anticipate, of course. By the end of the week, they're, they're all going to be disappointed because they didn't understand that Jesus, the son of David, rode into Jerusalem to assume his throne. For sure, it was the throne of the cross. And he came to give independence, for sure, but it's liberation. It's freedom in him. It's not the kind of political, worldly independence that they had hoped that the Messiah would bring. So Jesus accomplishes what he set out to accomplish, but he does it in a way that is contrary to what they had anticipated of the Messiah. Now, what about the geography? How is everything happening here also geographically loaded? Well, keep in mind a couple of passages, both of these from the Gospel of Luke. On the bottom right-hand corner, I have Luke 9.50. This is kind of the, the midpoint of the gospel because it says, when the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face. He resolutely set his face to go to Jerusalem. That is to say, that was his goal. That was where he was heading from that point on. Why? Well, if you go to Luke 13, we read Jesus saying, it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. And then he has this lament. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to you. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. So the fact that Jesus is riding into Jerusalem, into that particular city, having said everything and having set his face to go to Jerusalem, you know that the geography is going to be crucial. But there's more to it than simply him going to the city of Jerusalem. So on this particular map, you can see the way that he approached. He approached from Bethany and Bethphage, and he's going to go to the Mount of Olives, and then he's going to descend into the Kidron Valley, and then he's going to work his way into the city itself. That's the way in which he rides into Jerusalem. The direction that he approaches Jerusalem is significant. We've mentioned this recently in one of my other videos, but notice when you go back to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 10, that the glory of the Lord departed from the defiled temple by way of the east gate. That's what Ezekiel 10, 18, and 19 is talking about. Then Ezekiel eleven twenty three 23 says, The glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain, that is the Mount of Olives, that is on the east side of the city. So the glory of the Lord is leaving the city of Jerusalem. It's departing by way of the east and going up to the Mount of Olives. But then... Later in Ezekiel's book, as a book into this, as a complement to what he saw earlier, in Ezekiel 43, the glory of the Lord returns. The glory of God comes from the east, and it enters the temple by the gate facing east. And so the glory of the Lord, which had departed, now returns. Meaning that Jesus' entry into Jerusalem from the east, from Bethany, and from Bethphage, down the Mount of Olives, up the Kidron Valley, in by way of the east, all of that is significant when you know the book of Ezekiel because it means it means that the glory of the Lord is returning, is returning to Jerusalem. But here's the kicker. When this glory of the Lord, that is Jesus, enters into the temple, what he's going to find is a temple that is still defiled. It's a den of robbers, as Jesus will say, quoting the book of Jeremiah. And so what's, what's he going to do? Well, he's going to overturn the tables of the money changers. He's going to let loose the animals, and he's basically going to declare by way of quoting Jeremiah that this den of robbers is ripe for destruction, which of course is going to happen in A.D. 70. So Jesus 
Jesus is the new son of David, but he doesn't like Solomon ride into the city and then eventually construct the temple. He rather rides in Jerusalem, and he's going to deconstruct the temple. He's going to say this temple is done. And, of course, as we know, he's going to reconstruct it. He's going to make a new temple, but it's not going to be a, uh, a, a, a structure, a physical structure. It's going to be instead his own body. It's not going to be a building, but it's going to be his body. That will be the temple that he makes by way of his death and resurrection. Now, finally, how is this account scripturally saturated? Well, we've already seen several examples of that, but here's the one that's kind of in the background here. Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. Zechariah prophesies, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, look, your king is coming to you. He's righteous and having salvation. He's humble, or meek is another way you can translate that, and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And then he says he's going to destroy war. He's going to cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off. And he, that is this king, shall speak shalom, peace to the nations. And his rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So Zechariah prophesies, and some of the other gospel writers include this in their account of Jesus' entry, that this is being fulfilled. What Zechariah had spoken of, this meek king riding on a donkey, this humble king riding on a donkey, has now arrived. And he brings with him what? Salvation and peace and a kingdom. Lurking in the background also is this quotation that Luke records on the part of the people. So the various gospel writers record different words on the part of the people, but in Luke's case, verses 37 and 38, He says that as the people drew near, they were praising God with a loud voice for all his mighty works. And here's what they said. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now, where is this coming from? Well, the first part is from Psalm 118, verse 26. So blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But he bless you from the house of the Lord. Notice what's happened too. The psalm says, blessed is he who comes. But... When the people sing it, they say, blessed is the king. They're more specific, not just he, but the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And secondly, the peace in heaven and glory in the highest is from Psalm 148, verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. So they pulled from two different sections of the book of Psalms in order to acclaim him as the one who comes in the name of the Lord and the power of and in the authority of Yahweh himself, in order that he might bring peace and salvation as he establishes his kingship. And then also, in the background here, is what happened when Solomon rode into Jerusalem as the anointed son of David. Go back to 1 Kings chapter 1, verses 39 through 40, and we're told that after Zadok anointed Solomon, they blew the trumpet, and all the people said, Long live King Solomon, and all the people went up after him, And they were not silent. They were playing on pipes and rejoicing with great joy so that the earth was split by their noise. So it was this great excitement when Solomon rode in Jerusalem. And now there's a great excitement as Jesus rides into Jerusalem as well. So all of this together, both the the geography and and the scriptures that that are quoted and the images and the political stuff, all these things that are happening are an indication of the, the importance of this particular day and also an indication of why, as soon as this triumphant entry happened, thing, other things began to happen rapidly. You have the Jewish leaders planning the arrest of Jesus. You have the arrest. You have the, the trial. You have the, the, the execution. Everything happened very quickly after the events of Sunday because what happened on Sunday made it abundantly clear to anybody who knew the Scriptures that Jesus of Nazareth was believed to be, and as we know, was indeed the Messiah. And so his opponents realized they needed to do something fast, and so they did. But from our perspective, who know that Jesus is the Messiah, this is a crucial account because here we see Jesus receiving a claim as Messiah. He's not telling them to be quiet. He knows why he's come. He's purposely planning this because he knows that it's time. It's time for him, the seed of David, the son of David, to ride into the city and to take his place on the throne, the cruciform throne, so that by shedding his blood, by being resurrected, he might establish the kingdom 
that's from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth, the kingdom of God of which we are made members thanks to his life, death, and resurrection. As we step into this new year, as we enter into this first Sunday of Advent, I pray that the Lord will bless you as you reflect upon everything that he's done for us through his son, as we study his word, as we reflect upon everything that's coming up in these gospel readings. And I pray these videos may prove to be an, an ongoing help to you as you reflect upon that word. May God's grace, mercy, and peace be each of yours in abundance, and we'll see you next week.